Hi, everyone, and welcome to the new PCR webinar entitled, How do I ensure long valve durability for my target patients? My name is Giuseppe Tarantini, interventional cardiology, and I work and in the University of Padua, Italy, and actually, I'm very, very pleased to chair this session together with two dear friends, colleagues, and distinguished interventional cardiologists that are, you know, a renowned, you know, scientists and operators. The first one is Nicolas Van Migen, Rotterdam, uh, Netherlands. And the other one is another Nicolas, this is Dumontel in Clinique Pasteur, Toulouse, France. So actually, you know, very welcome to all of you. And let's get started with uh, the webinar with, uh, you know, the first slide that is the usual, you know, traditional uh, slide. Please, could you put up the, in the slide because it doesn't work the remote control. So, you know, this slide is just to put in the contest, the webinar. So attend this PCI webinar if you want to know and to learn more about valve durability, why it is important in patients with long life expectancy. The second point is to understand how valve design may influence valve hemodynamic. And finally, to discuss with the experts the lifetime management for patients with the aortic stenosis. So I have just one slide before, you know, getting started with the real case and just to fix the rules of this meeting. So actually what this meeting should be for me and for us, this meeting needs to be very focused, interactive, to facilitate discussion, need to be an opportunity for all of you, need to be informative, and at the end, need to be fun. So actually, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, please not only be connected, not only attend the meeting, but please feel fully engaged from the very early beginning to post question. And then we have Nicholas Van Migen and Dumontel that will manage you know, the discussion to discuss all the outstanding points that deserve more discussion with all of you. Having said that, for the sake of time, I think it's important to start with the case. Um, so please give me the first slide of the case. So what we are going to discuss today is a female, 76 years old. Actually, she's an obese, class one, obesity, among the risk factor, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, uh, and the patient had a history of AFib on DOAC, non staining 2015, treated with a PCI on LAD. And in 2019, you know, there was the finding of asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis on clinical follow-up. In 2021, was admitted because of dyspnea near class 3. Okay, what about the metrics? The metrics are important. This is the eco findings. The, uh, the mean gradient was 50, more than 50 millimeters of mercury. The aortic valve area was below one. The VUMAX was about five meters per second. That is huge. Calcific flex with mild out regurgitation. What about the ejection fraction was normal without any dilation of left ventricle. And there were, you know, mild or moderate other bulk disease like mitral 2 plus, tricuspid 1 plus, and the pulmonary pressure, right, pulmonary pressure was below 35. And so what about the aorta? We didn't find any specific dilation of the ascending aorta. This is the angel, left ventricle, that is an hypertrophy hypercontractile ventricle, this is the angel of the ascending aorta. Coronary artery is some moderate disease on the right and the left, but actually I didn't see any major blockage at the level of the, the proximal parts of the right and left coronary artery. Another very important matrix that actually is the gold standard to proceed and to make a decision in terms of final treatment of these patients. And in case of TAVI, what is the valve, what is the sizing, and so on. So what we measure is the LVOT, the annulus, the sinus of Valsalva, and the amounts and the burden 
of decalcification. As you can see, the average diameter is about 21, and the level of the left ventricular outflow tract, the level of the annulus is, is below 21. The sign of Valsalva are really roomy, 27 millimeter, and there is a significant calcification at the level of the <clears throat> of the leaflets of the cup of the aorta. What about the height of the coronary takeoff? That is 11 millimeter for the left, 30 millimeter for the right, and the sinotubular junction is about 27 millimeter. Other things, other things to consider is the angle of the aortic arch, the calcification of the aortic arch. As you can see, we have 45 degrees of the ventricular aorta angle, also that is important. And so, you know, in the pre-procedural plan phase, it's very important to you know to envisage what are the mm, coplanar view and the cathodic view, just to, you know, not only to save time, but to reduce the contrast dye injection in this patient during the procedure. So the pre-procedural planning is almost everything in every time procedure. What about the peripheral vasculature? Here you can see that there is a huge calcification at the level of descending aorta. There is a great tortility of the, uh, you know, on the left hand side of the patient, you know, the left iliac artery and the femoral artery. But actually, when we focus to the minimal reference diameter, even though it's more tortuous, the axis seems to be more favorable for the left side rather than the right side of the patients. So actually, we have to think at the valve and mostly at the system, delivery system, that, is, that has a good navigability and trackability, and there is the possibility to tackle also, you know, reference-based diameter. It may be, you know, between 6 and even 5.5 millimeters. So this is very important for the final selection of the valve system in these patients. So this is the summary for all the people that are attending, you know, in this meeting. You know, on the left hand side, the clinical aspect, severe symptomatic autistenosis, 76 years old. The STS score is about three, three five. So it's relatively low risk. We can say low risk. Frailty index is six, and about the matrix, we know that we are we have to move with the annulus that is 21 millimeter perimeter diameter is 20.8, and actually you know the coronary artery is clear, and the what about the the axis is four millimeter on the right and six millimeter on the left on the page of the patient. So having said that, I think that. We have to put patients in the heart team. So what is your practice? I don't know the pra your practice in your institution, but in my institution, that is the University of Padua, what we do is to apply the guidelines. But for me, it's very important to try to objectively standardize what we discuss. So we arrive with this report during the heart team. That is a kind of final report with a final score they take into consideration clinical, anatomical, and other conditions. And before getting started with the discussion in our team, we know that the objective aspects, guideline-based guideline recommendation, favor the TAVI approach with a final score that is three against one. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to make the math. It is important for me to start with something that is, you know, at least you know, close to objectivity of the next discussion. So for in this case, you know, we favor the TAVI approach instead of the SAV approach because of different clinical, anatomical aspects and other cardiac condition. So our decision process before the discussion, this is my last slide and then start the discussion. And so please, you know, post your question also in this regard. Local anesthesia, we have a very minimalistic approach. We don't have anesthesiology, we don't have surgeons in our room. We use super close proglide. We decide to go with that, but we can discuss balloon pre 
And we decided to go for transfermer approach, left axis. We want to use Navitor 23 millimeter. Because in this case, we have a small annually. We can discuss thoughts about that. And so we decided the goal was to go with commission elements for the lifetime patient strategy of the patient. Having said that, I think we can start our discussion. And so, dear Nicholas Dumontel and Van Migen, so the first point to discuss, probably I would like to start with Van Migen first. I don't know what is, you know, the way you decide in your institution, if you use an algorithm that is very similar to what I, you know, shared with all of you, what is other conditions, other things that you consider. Nicholas, it's up yeah. to you. Well, well, first of all, uh, Giuseppe, I think you, you made a very clear presentation of the patient that we're going to treat in a second. And uh, I also believe it illustrates that also the pre-procedural planning is maturing. You, you really demonstrated this multi-layer aspect of risk stratification, but also in terms of CT scanning, um, there are these new items like cusp overlap that we will discuss later on that uh, have become very important and relevant in current practice. But going back to the risk, risk stratification, I think there are several layers to it. Um, we, we don't do the math. Uh, with the ESC guidelines uh, in the room when we have this multidisciplinary approach. But we would have the same uh, consensus as you had in Padua related to this patient. And the main driver um, uh, to choose uh, for a TAVI procedure in this patient would be the small anatomy. Because even though the STS score is low, because of the small anatomy, a surgeon should have to do a root enlargement in order to avoid a small the implantation of a small valve. And also in view of lifetime management uh, in a 76-year-old uh, female who has at least 10 to 15 more years to go, um, I think you have to avoid the implantation of uh, bioprosthetic valves that are smaller than 23 and definitely 21 millimeters. So this is where I believe that um, definitely the, the weight would be in favor of a, a TAVI procedure because, again, a surgeon would have to do a root enlargement, which would make the procedure much more cumbersome and not as reproducible as you want it to be from a technical point of view. I don't know, Nicolai, in Toulouse, is it, is it something similar? Yeah, um, yeah, Nico, we, we would have exactly, I think, more or less the same decision-making process uh, within our health team. Um, and, and you're right, the, the, the consideration of uh, hemodynamic performance at the, at the short term and its consequence for the long term uh, um, durability and the long term uh, journey of these patients would be a crucial point for decision. So I think uh, considering the age of this patient, all that was presented, we will also vote for a TAVI procedure. But we will keep in mind in our technique and uh, we will discuss that during the following minutes, that for this low-risk, long-life expectancy patient who has also an history of coronary artery disease, uh, who has a small annulus, then we have to be rigorous in our technique, choose a prosthesis that will uh, provide the patient a good effective orifice area for the future, and adopt a technique that will uh, um, give the patient uh, a good chance to have coronary uh, um, artery catheterization if it's necessary. But actually, Nicolas, Nicolas, I would like to step in because I think that the point raised by Nicolas Van Megan is really outstanding. And I think also for the people at home, it's important to, you know, to tell something more about the importance of good hemodynamics in the context of small aortic angles. Do you have some, you know, consideration to say the different valves? What is your, you know, your feeling about that? Nicolas? Yeah, 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 you're right. It, it's important maybe to develop a little bit, little, little bit more about that. And uh, roughly based on of our experience and of based on some data you have on the literature, for such 20.8 millimeter uh, diameter annulus in, in this woman, 
um, I would not make the choice to implant a 23 millimeter balloon expandable valve uh, because um, I know that in the all the the portfolio of commercially available valves that I, we have in my center, it would be probably um, the choice that would provide the the, the minimal uh, effective orifice area and the higher mean gradient. So I would favor probably a self-expandable one. And uh, you know that uh, in the self-expandable uh, portfolio, we have the supra annular uh, evolute platform uh, who has shown in, in data that Nico has recently uh, demonstrated at the short and long term, really good uh, performance, hemodynamic performance. But uh, we also, and you can have this on the, on the screen in a few seconds uh, on a slide, we also have in small annually uh, some very convincing data fr coming from uh, a, a self-expandable intra-annular platform like the Portico, and I would like you to have this slide under, under your eyes to, to come to, to fix this idea. And uh, you will see that in a second in this slide that uh, when you compare in small annually be below 23 millimeter, both hemodynamic performance, then you, you have almost uh, equal uh, hemodynamic performance regarding the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch between Evolute and Portico. And this is what you have under your eyes at the moment. This is a very good point. So actually, just, uh, you know, one more comment says the following. So, so do you think that at the end it's kind of class effect in terms of self-expandable valve rather than, you know, the position of the leaflets? What are your thoughts? It really, in a few seconds, just to... What do you think? Well, I think... I think the concepts are developing. Um, there was a time that we said that we would say only super annular self-expanding devices and only one uh, in smaller anatomies. That has matured now. There are several options. And I think that uh, you always have to look at the broader picture. Uh, what about uh, coronary access? What about calcium distribution? What about the risk for conduction disorders? And then come to a final, more patient-tailored uh, platform selection. So we are maturing uh, in that direction. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think that we can start with the line in a box to the Regia because we decided to go with Navitor. That is the last iteration. It's not the Portugal anymore, it's Navitor. And actually, uh, please, let's go ahead with the live in a box to the Regia. One, it's a pleasure to be connected with all of you today. Let me introduce before getting started the Padua team of today. Close by, I have uh, Dr. Tommaso Fabris. Then we have Giulio, that is a fellow in training. It is something very important to us during this kind of procedure. Then we have the technician, that is Giovanni, and the nurses, uh, that is Stella and, uh, and Paolo. So now we can get started. As you can see here, we have two axes uh, on the right groin, that is the one is for you know the angio and the other one is for the temporary pacing actually what we're gonna do is an angio guided puncture of the left groin As you can see here, we have a significant tortuosity with some degree of calcification, but actually this right hand side, the left hand side of the patient, is, seems to be a little bit more favorable in terms of minimal lumen diameter. So actually we're gonna try to go from the left hand side axis. As you can see, in the two axes, we have the pigtail, temporary pacing. We cross the valve, and now actually, considering that based on the metrics of CT scan, we have decided also because the gradient 
is above 40 millimeter of mercury, we decided to go with a pre gentle predilatation with an 18 millimeter balloon, just to make also a double check in terms of you know, the final sizing of the valve. That is very, very likely it is a 23 millimeter Navitor valve in this case. As you can see during the balloon predilatation with 18 millimeter balloon, the balloon is really fixed and we don't have a major leakage. So actually in this case, we prefer to go with a 23 millimeter valve Navitor because considering that we have the ceiling, the ceiling cuff and the skirts, this, is, this might be forgiving in terms of final PVL without increasing the rate of pacemaker for that kind of patient. So, okay, I think we drop the live in a box here because there is, I think, the first crossroad to discuss with you that you are, you know, renowned experts in this field, but also, also to the people that I Tom, I, Tom, I think, you know, might, you know, want to know a little bit more about the use of balloon predilatation with this type of valve, in this case, the Navitor, but also with other self-expandable valve. Is it routine for you? What is the size of the of the balloon that you decide to go? And uh, you know, I think it's important at that point to discuss these these things. First of all, Nicolas Mamet, and then Nicolas Dumont telling that. Well, um, I think uh, in terms of balloon predilatation, um, it has a, there is a pendulum swinging back and forth. And a couple of years ago, we were trying to reduce uh, the predilatation uh, to as much as we could. Uh, but now, with the maturation of these newer devices, um, I must say, for instance, with Navitor, but also uh, with an accurate valve. Uh, platform, we would have a low threshold to do a pre-dilatation with an undersized balloon. And the balloon size would then be uh, measured based on the CT dimensions. Uh, when you do a full analysis of your uh, aortic root, you will have a minimum diameter, a maximum diameter, an area and a perimeter derived diameter. Well, typically we would, we would rely then on the smallest diameter for the pre-dilatation balloon. And I would say now these days, 50% of our cases would, uh, would have a pre-dilatation involved. Nicolas, what is your practice? And actually, do you have any given balloon that you prefer that means semi-compliant, compliant? Do you go with the minimal uh, refer the minimal diameter or the perimeter perimeter derived average of the meter in terms of yeah we, we 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 have a policy that is different regarding the the, the models of uh, devices but uh, to come uh, to discuss more specifically we with portico navitor platform um, um we are, the rate of predilatation is quite high and uh, we are aligned with uh, what uh, Nico just uh, said. We use the, the, uh, the balloon uh, sized according to the minimal diameter of the annulus. It's a preparatory uh, predilatation, but it's not meant to be too aggressive. Um, what, I, what I would add is that um, we, we do not rely too much on the, the angio ring balloon to confirm the sizing. So in other words, uh, whatever we we uh, notice during that phase, in most of the cases, most of the time, it does not make us change our sizing that has been uh, beforehand uh, done according to the CT measurements that you you showed and uh, and you mentioned. And the only maybe situation in which I, uh, this angio during balloon uh, dilatation could be, I think, uh, really interesting is to have a dynamic assessment of the risk of periprocedural coronary occlusion by a leaflet, because we know that we have some CT scan predictors on that, but they are not dynamic. And sometimes the dynamic behavior of a leaflet pushed by the balloon during that step can be useful also. Now, okay, agree. So the point is for the audience, so now the minimal size of the balloon, 
match uh, the minimal diameter of the elliptic or the elliptic uh, annulus, etc., just to avoid any rupture, because in this case, there is significant calcification, but be more than enough, because as you can see, there was no to and fro movement of the balloon, so also the 18 millimeter balloon without you know a full inflation was really stuck within the annulus so it means that you know we don't need to push too much the envelope and to create any injury of the annulus so this might be more than enough agree that probably we don't need to make the angel but sometimes if we there is just to make a, you know a double check of what we are doing especially when the renal function is pretty normal we used to inject 15 cc so it's not a big deal but actually i fully agree with pay? both of you Giuseppe, I have uh, because uh, we, as you indicted uh, our our uh, colleagues connected to ask questions. Uh, I have to say that uh, we are really happy because we have colleagues from uh, Syria, Europe, Euro Europe, from uh, South America who are connected and asking questions. And one is coming to your point of chronic uh, kidney disease. Um, as the patient has already a grade 3 chronic kidney disease and, and chronic kidney disease can be a determinant on the long term uh, for uh, valve durability impairments, uh, do you this think is, it could be, very... it could be an, uh, an argument to reduce the contrast during the procedure? This is a question from uh, one of our colleagues. Yes, ideally it's always worth reducing the contrast dye. This is a general concept, this is like that. Related to the, you know, generation uh, induced, you know, by the CKD, we have some science, historically from the surgical science, that know that for severe and, you know, in patient dialysis, we have a much faster degeneration of the biological prosthesis. Actually, there are some reports related to the TAV procedure, but mostly, you know, that in case of severe CKD, it is one of the indications to not operate the patient. So actually, we need more science in this regard. I don't know what is the feeling of you both, if you wanna, one of you want to intervene also related to these questions. I don't know, Megan, yeah, well, if you have any. Yeah. Yeah, I so first of all, I totally agree with you. Eh? When a patient has uh, an impaired kidney function, then the balance will shift more towards TAVI than towards surgery because surgery is associated with more kidney issues after uh, the intervention or after the operation. But that said, I would totally agree with, uh, with our colleague uh, who posed the question that I would try to minimize the use of contrast as much as possible. And that would also include not using uh, contrast uh, when I do a balloon pre-dilatation. The only time that I would do it, and I must say I do it maybe twice or three times a year, is uh, when there is really a borderline uh, uh, question. You know, there's a borderline sizing issue uh, and you want to and, and there is also, especially if it's in combination with calcium, because then you would want to opt for the smaller size and then you need to be sure that you would completely uh, fill the annulus with the smaller size. That could be an argument. And sometimes in bicuspid disease also, because uh, there the annular sizing might sometimes be um, complemented by commissural sizing and that might lead to a smaller or a different valve size selection and then also balloon sizing uh, using contrast during the balloon dilatation can 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 become handy, but in general, I would refrain uh, from from using this additional contrast during a ballooning. Yeah, this is a good point. But actually, in a, we have done okay. But actually, for the people like at home, you need to keep in mind that in this patient, the takeoff of the left main was just eleven millimeters. So in this case, this is not because of the education aspect of the case. I prefer to make a, a little injection to be reassured by the fact that the calcium tilted up won't threat the left main. So this is another thing to consider, but I fully agree with Nicolas Mami. We do want to tell with all of you that we have, you know, to not you know, inject too much contrast dye in a patient. But actually, this is the reason why uh, you will see during the live case, we don't have just to place the valve in place. We need to orient the valve. 
because especially when the takeoff that is very low, it is very risky if you have as a play of chance, you know, the asymmetry kit of the portico of all the other self-expandable valve in front of the left main. But anyway, in this case, the sinus was very roomy, so it's not a major deal, but it's important to fix the concept. To the Regia, please go ahead with the live in a box. Here we are with the Navitor system that include two parts. The first one is the delivery that I call the stem is the flex nav. Flex nav stay for flex flexibility and now for navigability, hydrophilic delivery, 14 French equivalents that is outer 18 French. Actually moving on, you know the you know the valve, this is the navitor that looks like pretty the same <clears throat> of the portico, but there are major differences. The first one and the most important probably is the skirt outside to minimize the PVL. Then we have the tab, these parts, it has been curved in to be, you know, not too much traumatic for the ascending art. And finally, you know, the engineers were able to optimize the radial strength of this valve. Actually, the design, as you can see, there is an open cell design to get an easy access of the coronary artery. And also, we might go, we might try also to orientate the valve based on the three, you know, commissures that in this case we will try to orientate. Okay, now we go in with the valve that is sheetless, but actually before getting in, just to be a little bit more orientated, the recommendation is to rotate from zero clockwise 90 degree and to push in uh, the valve like that with this orientation. Here you can see that we have in coplanar view, we have the three tabs with one in the middle and two uh, at the outer parts of the, of the screen. What is important to do in these low risk patients and relative young patients is to considering also the coronary artery disease, what is important is to try to orientate the valve. So we move from the coplanar view to the coronary cusp overlap view. This is the coronary cusp overlap view. And as you can see, if you look at the post, there is a slit-like post on the right-hand side of the monitor. That means that we are in a good position as related to the coronary engagement afterwards with the catheter. Okay, now we have half the cell. I think it's acceptable. We can stop here, and I think we have another very important point to discuss. It is the depth of implantation with this Navitor system, and actually, you know, what is, you know, the right implantation depth? And as you can see during the in a box for the people at home, I was able to manage all the things by myself. We don't need two or three operators because with this valve, and I would like just to express the concept, having the internal leaflets, when you open up the valve, the leaflets uh, start working from the very early beginning. So you don't have the parachute effect that you have with the other subranular valve. So you don't need to, you know, to make so many movements to stabilize the valve. So you can just unscrew and to you know, open up the valve without any major adjustment. But the point is that for you, 
uh, for all of you, you know, Dumontel or Van Migen, which is your behavior in terms of depth of implantation with this valve? First, I think, uh, you know, Van Migen, you can start first with that. And please, um, I would like well, to invite the Regia to put up the slide that's, uh, you know, for the people at home to understand exactly, to visualize what is the recommended depth of implantation. Please, sorry oh. for interrupting you, Nicholas. No problem. So uh, well, let me give you a general overview, and then I, I would suggest that uh, that Nicolas in Toulouse would then dive in a little bit deeper using the slides. But obviously, you want to avoid a deep implantation because the deeper the implant gets, uh, the more interaction you will get with the conduction system and the higher the likelihood will be uh, of conduction disorders and the need for new pacemakers. So you want to avoid uh, too deep implants. Uh, basically, you would aim for three millimeters or less as an implantation depth. And there are some ways to achieve that. I think um, this new generation Navitor system really has uh, not only this uh, uh, flex nav, it's very flexible and very maneuverable. It navigates very easy through anatomies, but it also is extremely stable during the deployment uh, with its, uh, in, and with its intra-annular design. There is also no hemodynamic compromise as you are deploying the system. So in that that regard it becomes a very um, very reproducible and a very relaxed implantation but again so the principle would be try to aim and try to stay within three millimeters of uh, the annulus uh, of the patient so Nicola can you dive in a little bit further using the slides yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, the idea is just to to um, give our colleagues maybe a clear idea of what is the theoretical because uh, we know that we in real practice we have to adapt the, the theoretical ideal target depth with this device and ju just have a look at the the picture that you have in, under your eyes you you see that uh, from the distal tip of a frame to the uh, half of a cell that is just above according to the sizes you have between seven or eight millimeters and what you just have to target visually speaking at the time of deployment is to position your anus line at midway between those two limits so in other words around around three millimeter that is your um, optimal target depth that will ensure on one side a good ceiling and on the other side, low interaction with conduction tissue to reduce the pacemaker issue. Perfect. I think this is very important. Also, you know, by the shape of the frame, that this barrel-like is not, you know, like fun. You know, it's more stable when you implant there the valve, and also, you know, the the. the you know, the engineeristic aspect and the construction of the delivery system permit to have a really stab st stable, you know, a very predictable and reproducible, you know, way and of implantation. This is very important. Actually, let's move on for the sake of time with the third and final part of the video. And then uh, we discuss again about the points of this case. Please, to the Regia, go ahead with the third part of the video the valve okay is it free yes okay here we go yes yes now we have to close the valve before removing it, like that. Okay, the valve seems to be well positioned in terms of depth of implantation. We don't have any significant conduction disturbances because it was pre-existing. We don't have a V-block. Actually, the heart rate is exactly the one we started with the case and now is you know the the double check of what we have done and so i'm gonna do the angiography that's it okay the result seems good i don't see any leakage uh, i wouldn't say zero 
And actually, now we go to try to, you know, to selectivate, to encannulate the coronary artery. This is the right coronary artery, as you can see, it was very easy to engage. And actually, you know that the right coronary artery is the most difficult part of this story because it's a little bit more difficult to engage the right. Now we go for the left. Okay, here you can see the, engaging, the engagement of the left coronary artery. This is the angio. Okay, it was really straightforward because, you know, the orientation matters. It's very, very important. And actually also the open cell design is very useful to facilitate the coronary access. Now we go for the closure with uh, the tubular glide of the axis on the left-hand side, we remove the pacemaker, and then we make an angio just to be sure to not have any major significant problem in, at the level of peripheral vasculature. Now, what is extremely important is to make a double check of the orientation of the tabs. So this is the coplanar view, where you can clearly see the three different tabs, one in the middle and the other two at the outer portion of the frame. And now we move with a technician, with a technician to the cusp overlap view. Let's see the rotation. Here we are. Now it's impressive because you have two tabs that, that, that are one of the other on the left-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen, you have the tab that stay between you know, the, two, uh, the, the two cusps. So we are pretty sure that we stay away from the coronary. We have already engaged the coronary, but this visualization is extremely important to understand more what we have done. Okay, thank you, the case is finished. Actually, as you can see, small annually, possibility to engage the coronary artery by the orientation of the valve, you know, navigability of the delivery systems is just to, you know, to share with all of you the potential aspect of this new navigator system. Thank you for your attention. See you soon, bye-bye. Okay, very good. I think uh, there are at least two points that I would like to discuss with you, with the two Nicolases. Uh, with the first Nicolas is Van Migen. I would like to discuss about, you know, the vascular access that is a quite, you know, a hot topic for the last months in the Tavi world. And the other one is the large ball closure device. If you can put in perspective, what you do in practice, what is your feeling about this? Yeah, so um, Giuseppe, I think access site management is crucial for uh, each and every TAVI procedure. And uh, there has been a recent randomized trial that was presented at TCT and published in circulation. That is the choice closure trial. And we have a slide that summarizes the primary endpoint. Basically, the trial included more than 500 patients and as such complemented the MESH TAVI trial that uh, Nicolas and I did um, earlier. Uh, that was also a randomized trial comparing the MANTA plug-based closure with suture-based closure. And basically, those are the two commercially available closure techniques uh, for large-bore arteriotomy closure um, that are globally available. And um, the primary endpoint of both trials basically was any vascular access uh, complication. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the outcome was a little bit different. In choice closure, there were almost 20% uh, vascular complications with the Manta device versus 11% uh, with suture-based closure. In the MESH trial, uh, we had 
10% uh, vascular access uh, side complications, and the majority were minor complications, versus 4% with suture-based closure. In MASH, which was a smaller trial, that was not uh, statistically significant, but in the uh, closure study, so the choice closure, there was a significant difference in favor of suture-based closure. I think um, we are also maturing in that regard. I think there are patients who would fare better with a plug-based closure. Uh, on the other hand, um, suture-based closure still is the reference, and I believe it is the reference because you always have this uh, wire in place that can serve for bailout uh, maneuvers. You can have, uh, you can use bailout additional suture, uh, suture devices, or you could use an angio seal, for instance, to finish up uh, uh, your access management when you when you would rely on a manta-based closure, you only have the plug, the collagen basically, and the anchor on the inside. And if it fails, yeah, then there is no real bailout maneuver that you can do other than either um, a vascular surgical approach or a covered stent. But I have to also say that there were some difference be between the two uh, trials. And the main difference, uh, I think, was that in um, the choice closure, only the 18 French Manta device was used. And that is a little bit strange, of course, because we have a 14 and an 18 French system. And if you would use these 14 French equivalent devices, like for instance, the Navitor or the Evolute Pro Plus, then you would not need an 18 French Manta. You would need a 14 French Manta. And of course, the larger you get, the higher the likelihood of uh, uh, complications. So if you would deliberately upgrade an arteriotomy for, from 14 French to 18 French, just in order to put in an 18 French Manta, I think you make a little bit of a mistake. That's one. And the other main difference between the two trials is that we relied predominantly on ultrasound guided access uh, in the MASH trial. And that was only applied in 12% of the cases uh, in choice closure. And I think that is definitely one of the takeaways. Uh, if you want, you, you really need meticulous access site management. And I am uh, a proponent of ultrasound guided access because you really can see where the needle will enter uh, the arteriotomy side. That's one. You can avoid calcium, but also it is a safe approach because there's no radiation involved and also no additional contrast. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. In the meanwhile, from the regia, probably we have a slide showing the results of the choice closure trial. If you can put up on the screen to the regia, so one comment that I would like to make is for the month user, the tumor, not this one. Is this the conclusion case? Uh, is no. this one? That one is the one that Nicholas has commented just to visualize for the people at, at home. But actually, the main pre predictor of failure of the manta is the degree of calcification, but it's very, very important and minimal reference diameter. When you use a Navitor system, you can go with the 14 French. And this is a very important point uh, that we have as a takeaways for all the people connected because I have an outer French that is 20, but is 18, 18 French. So you can go with the 14 French Manta that cover up to 18 French. So this is very important. The vast majority of the failure are related to the occlusion of the vessel and not to the failure in terms of bleeding or other things. But actually move to fast forward because we have 10 minutes left for the case, this is quite exciting. I would love to stay 10 minutes or 15 minutes more. The time of connection is going to expire, but is for Dumontel. Dumontel, what about, when we talk about lifetime strategy, we have to consider two very important variables. The first one is the coronary access, and the second one is the commissure alignment. Could you tell us a little bit more how to standardize what we have to think, you know, beforehand uh, for these kind of very important aspects of the procedure. Yeah, th thank you, Giuseppe. And your question is is, is coming uh, really, really well because we had uh, this question coming from uh, uh, several people connected in the audience asking to have more explanation about commissural alignment in general, but with this device. So, of course, as you see here, 
the the issue is coronary access after TAVI, and it's uh, even more uh, important when we treat longer life expectancy patients. Uh, and if we think about this issue of coronary access after TAVI, we know from experience of uh, our experience of interventional cardiologists, and we know from CT scan post TAVI studies that one of the major determinants of a coronary access failure is to have the post, the commissure of a transcatheter valve uh, seated, seated, located just in front of a coronary ostium, what is uh, illustrated here in this slide, uh, and that is called the commissural misalignment. So it led us uh, as operators to try to improve the technique of our transcatheter valve implantations to try to align the commissures of the uh, transcatheter valve with the native commissures of a patient and that way to uh, avoid this post, this post and commissure positioning in front of a coronary ostia. So um, now to give maybe more details about the method, how to reach that, and especially with a Navito valve, two things. First, the usefulness of this cusp overlap view, left, right, left, right cusp overlap view, you mentioned it in your live case, uh, Giuseppe, it's useful to have a proper visualization of your depth of implants. But if you see the diagram under your eyes here, you realize that, that it's also very useful to know where is located the native commissure between the left and the right of Alsalva sinus and the left and the right cusp. And when you look at your aortic root in the left right cusp of lab view, as illustrated here, your commissure between the right and the left is just to the right perpendicular to what you're seeing. So you know exactly where it is located. So knowing that, what you just have to know is what do you have as kind of target of landmark in your prosthesis to position the, the commissure of your prosthesis exactly in front of a native commissure because now you know where it is. And in the Navitor or Portico, you have those paddles uh, in which the, the top of the, of the post and the commissure are sutured. So you have shown that in, in your case. And again, it's illustrated here. When you come in with your portico or navitor valve in the left, right, left, right cusp overlap view, at the mid part of the frame, when you zoom in, you, keep, you can see those three, uh, um, those three paddles, those three posts, uh, when you have small uh, uh, rounds that are uh, visually uh, visually seen. And what you just have to have is have one post located at the right of your image, at the right of the screen, just pointing towards uh, of a native commissure of a patient. So you said, uh, Giuseppe, how to achieve that by orientating your capture at the time of introduction, but it's not 100% reliable. So what you can also do is a little bit talk your catheter to try to adjust that at the time of uh, alignment in this uh, cusp overlap view. But to be honest, um, the, your ability to adjust that is a little bit limited. You have maybe a 10, 20 degree tolerance to talk and to adjust that, but you can't correct a 60 degree misalignment. Correct. This is true. This is a very important message because sometimes you need, if you want to correct the intention, you need to go out. Sometimes you go back in the sending out uh, if, if you want to change the angle. Otherwise, if you make all this maneuver with the valve within the angle, sometimes you might have an hemodynamic decay, and this is not the case. So having said that, last words in terms to Nicolas Bami to tell us a little bit more about looking again to, you know, go back to the title. This is, a, you know, a webinar dedicated to the importance of the lifetime center patient strategy. So what about a lower risk patient with this system? Uh, Nicholas, do we have something in perspective to say on top of the other system that have randomized trial in this setting? Yeah, um, well, I think lifetime management is uh, very much in vogue these days. We talk a lot about it because we are really moving 
uh, with TAVI towards the lower risk and therefore also younger patients. And if we are treating younger patients, then you can anticipate that valve durability becomes relevant, but also coronary reaccess, as uh, Nicolas already mentioned. So I think these uh, we, we highlighted important concepts today. First is, well, if you want to proceed with a TAVI procedure, then you want to assure that you have very good hemodynamic performance of the valve. And this is what you can establish uh, and achieve with um, the Navitor system. Also, uh, although it is an intraannular functioning valve, still the hemodynamic performance looks quite favorable. And then this, the, the cell design, the cell strut design of uh, this platform is also very um, friendly in terms of re-engaging the coronaries, provided that you um, respected the commissural alignment. And I think we are still refining the techniques of commissural alignment with the different devices. There are some subtle differences between different platforms, but it is important to uh, to try and, uh, and assure this commissural alignment because 50% uh, of the patients with aortic stenosis also have concomitant coronary artery disease. So this is not a trivial uh, item. And I think uh, with this webinar, you definitely illustrated that uh, the Navitor platform is a platform to treat uh, lower risk patients with a good life expectancy. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Nicolas. So I think, uh, I don't know, Dumontel, do we have something that remain left term of the question from the attendees? Today, yeah, yeah, we we have uh, quite a lot of questions, and uh, um, I, I would ask them to you, but maybe very short answers as as we are running out of time, and we have a lot of them. Maybe to Nico van Meegen because of your background on that. Uh, what what would be the anti thrombotic therapy for this patient who has previous coronary artery disease, who, who is an uh, uh, oral anticoagulation because of atrial fibrillation, and who is at high high bleeding risk? Yeah, that's a very important matter, of course, and we have some data from the envisaged TAVI AF trial. Basically, um, you can you can go for a vitamin K antagonist or non-vitamin K antagonist to DOAX, and uh, we have data from Edoxaban. Basically, what it what matters is that you respect the dose reduction criteria. You should avoid overdosing in elderly patients who are in need of uh, a TAVR valve or a TAVI valve. But also, there is no place for concomitant oral antiplatelet drug therapy. And we have also updated ESC guidelines. So basically, if the patient is on oral anticoagulant drug therapy, do not uh, put these patients on oral antiplatelet drugs unless they are they had recent concomitant percutaneous coronary interventions. And if they had an intervention, then within six months, it is safe to stop the oral antiplatelets and continue with uh, oral anticoagulant drug monotherapy. That would be the abbreviated uh, response to that question. Great. great. Uh, Giuseppe, one for you. Uh, we partially addressed that, but uh, some, someone want, want to know more about that. Uh, surprising that Navitor has uh, uh, an equivalent uh, hemodynamic performance than the supra-annular platform evolute in small annulus. Do you confirm that? And actually, you know, the point is the following. As you have seen at the very early beginning of the Live in a Box by a slide from Nicolas Dumontel, if we make a comparison between Sabian and the other two valves, whatever it is, intranal or supranal for the surface part of our valve, seems that the final gradient is always a little bit better compared to you know the other valve that is the balloon expandable valve. We don't we cannot make an head-to-head -head comparison because we don't have randomized trial in this regard, but it seems to be a kind of class effect. I'm not sure if it is related to the difference between the inner and outer diameter that is smaller for the expandable valve compared to the balloon expandable valve, but actually you know the result that the data seems to to go in this direction. We 20 seconds left, let me say just a few things that is, you know, the summary of this and the key message for this meeting. So actually, Navitor is a newer, one of the latest iteration of TAVI generation system. So we have seen that this is, there is a good PVL sealing system that is a seal. We have a stable and accurate 
placement without pressure drop. And this is a different compared to the other subranular valve because as you seen during the live case, we didn't have any pressure drop and I worked as a single operator, not because I don't want to work with the others, colleagues, et cetera, just to show you that is quite stable the system. And this is very important. Low single digit gradient, in this case was five millimeter mercury, even though the annulus was 20 millimeters, so very small. Finally, the last two words is the compromise small vessels, vessel access because of the navitor, because of the liver system. I would like to remind to all the people that this is the only hydrophilic system. With the, even though with the same 14 French of the others, this one is hydrophilic. So it's mostly in this regard. Finally, easy coronary access because of the open cell design and the possibility of orientability as Nicolas Dumontel shows. So I enjoyed very much. You know, we got the goal to be informative, I believe, and to, at the end, to have also fun. So thank you. This is mainly due to the two Nicolas that helped me through this discussion. So thank you again. Good luck for everyone and see you soon in person in future meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah.